Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Jeff Cohen. I'm the Director of Public Affairs and Marketing for Informs, the largest association for operations research and analytics professionals. Today, we're going to be discussing how OR and analytics can be used to help with disaster preparedness and response and supply chain resiliency in those most difficult of times when a natural disaster occurs. We're joined today by two very distinguished guests, Dr. Pinar Keskinocek of Georgia Tech and Dr. Julie Swan of NC State. Dr. Pinar Keskinocek is the William W. George Chair of the Stewart School of Industrial and Systems Engineering, and she's also the co-founder and director of the Center for Health and Humanitarian Systems at Georgia Tech. Dr. Julie Swan is the department head and A. Doug Allison Distinguished Professor of Industrial and Systems Engineering at North Carolina State University. She was previously at Georgia Tech with Dr. Kaskinocek and was also a co-founder of the Center for Health and Humanitarian Systems while she was there. Dr. Kaskinocek and Dr. Swan will each give short presentations and then we'll move into a question and answer session. Dr. Kaskinocek, let me start with you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, so in this webinar, we will discuss how increasing supply chain resilience and responsiveness can help us better prepare and respond to extreme weather events and reduce the negative impact of such events on people's lives and the economy. We will quickly review the disaster timeline and the impact of natural disasters on communities. We will then discuss some examples of supply chain disruptions and their impact from recent disasters in the US. And our webinar will conclude with some recommendations regarding supply chain resilience for disaster preparedness and response. Natural disasters, including hurricanes, have affected many communities in the US and around the world over the past decades. And here's a quick look at the number and the variety of events with high economic and social impact just in 2020. Well, we probably all agree that 2020 was not the best year for humanity. So maybe it was an exception. Um, Unfortunately, when we look at the trends, a clear picture emerges. The number, the magnitude, and the impact of disasters have been increasing. And you may have been affected by such events and may have firsthand experience, or you probably know someone who did. So these concerning trends hold worldwide. Um, unfortunately, these extreme weather events are no longer rare events. This means that the way we prepare and respond to such events needs to evolve, and it needs to evolve fast um, if you want to make sure that we are proactive and ahead of the curve to mitigate significant human suffering and economic losses. Supply chains play a very important role in disaster preparedness and response. Of course, we rely on supply chains in every aspect of our daily lives, whether it's our basic needs, such as food and shelter or healthcare services or other activities that enrich our lives, such as travel and entertainment. So here we see a very nice summary of the disaster life cycle, specifically focusing on supply chains from a recent National Academy study in which I had the honor of participating. There are some key activities that need to take place during normal times and others during response. Our learnings and experiences from these stages then inform the long-term efforts on recovery and also mitigation. So during normal times, when these supply chains function efficiently and effectively, we can access the goods and services we need and we do not even think about their existence um, or the complexity of these supply chain operations. But when they are disrupted, the impact is often significant and it can be long lasting. Supply chains can become strained due to a variety of reasons. It can be a spike in demand, such as what we experienced with toilet paper during the early days, weeks of COVID. Um, it can be a reduction in capacity. Uh, this can happen due to physical damage, loss of power, shortages in labor, 
um, or it can be due to disruptions in communications. And any of these factors can create strain or bottlenecks in supply chains. So the key for resilient supply chains is that they have capabilities to rebalance and to respond quickly to return to normal operations. So next, let's take a look at a couple examples of supply chain disruptions during hurricanes and their short and long-term impact. Our first couple examples come from uh, 2017, hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria, which hit Texas, US Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico within an unprecedentedly short amount of time and with devastating impact. And these disasters highlighted the many vulnerabilities of our supply chains. Um, so let's quickly review some geographical characteristics about Houston. Uh, it is low elevation, which increases the risk of flooding, road closures, and contamination of the water supply, just to name a few. Over the years, um, due to the rapid and widespread development patterns, as we can see on the upper right uh, picture here, uh, wetlands and other green spaces were replaced with concrete or asphalt, further increasing these risks. When roads are flooded, this has significant impact on evacuation and also on the operations of supply chains. And in most disasters, unfortunately, vulnerable people or communities are disproportionately affected by these events. Uh, Port of Houston is a key hub for oil and gas shipping, and it's the nation's largest port for international shipments. So these observations highlight the importance of mapping critical infrastructure and also forecasting risks based on geographic, social, and economic characteristics. So despite these challenges, some things actually worked relatively well. Um, so here are a couple examples of good practices we can learn uh, and hopefully improve based on experiences from Harvey. So let's first discuss supply chain strengthening. This area has been hit by storms before, including Hurricane Ike in 2008. So learning from prior experiences, petrochemical industry and the utility companies were much better prepared this, prepared this time. For example, they had extra power supplies, um, placed some of their communication systems in other locations, they elevated control rooms and pump stations, and then placed intelligent sensors on the grid to improve situational awareness. So second, I want to highlight collaboration and coordination. This is very important during disaster preparedness and response. The Emergency Operations Center in Harris County coordinated communications and collaboration across a large number of public and private sector entities. The Port of Houston also had a coordination team with representatives from a variety of groups, such as the oil refineries, Army Corps, weather services, law, in, law enforcement, and so on. And most importantly, these groups have known each other and have worked together during normal times. They engaged in preparedness activities and exercises on an ongoing basis during normal times. Why is this important? Because this helps us build trust and ensures that everyone understands the system dynamics and also the impact of decisions in one part of the system on others. The um, National Business Emergency Operations Center and BEOC is activated by FEMA following disasters or emergencies, and, and this helps enhance communication and collaboration across different entities. This is an area where the federal government can also play a role during normal times to improve readiness and response to disasters. So we have a wide range uh, of knowledge and expertise at the federal level with lessons learned from a variety of events over the years. And it's very important to share this knowledge and provide support and education at the local level to increase readiness and to build connections and trust among various um, stakeholders. Um, now let's revisit Hurricane Maria and Puerto Rico. Uh, the impact has been devastating for the island with significant and long lasting damage on the already fragile infrastructure there. And there, there have been cascading impacts reaching beyond the island as well. So here's one example from pharmaceutical supply chains 
uh, there were over 40 manufacturing facilities for pharmaceuticals and medical goods in Puerto Rico. And 13 of these facilities were sole suppliers for the goods they produce. One critical product was saline, which is used to care for virtually all hospitalized patients, uh, for example, in IV therapy. Uh, over 200 million liters of saline is used typically in the US every year, and the supply is tight even during normal times. Uh, the leading manufacturer of sterile saline solutions, uh, Baxter, uh, meets the majority of the US demand and had three large manufacturing facilities in Puerto Rico. All of these facilities lost power after Hurricane Maria. So at that time, the criticality of these facilities on the nation's healthcare system was not well understood. So even though they were prioritized for power restoration, starting in October 2017, they were not able to return to full operation until early January 2018. Um, so this supply chain disruption impacted the healthcare systems around the US and even beyond. Um, of course, the pharmaceutical facilities in Puerto Rico had plant level preparedness and con continuity plans, which is great, but there was no nationwide visibility into these supply chains, identifying these facilities as critical nodes in pharmaceutical supply chains. So we were not well prepared for uh, this vulnerability. So this example highlights several activities in this disaster preparedness and response timeline, particularly mapping supply chains for critical products and services and also identifying vulnerabilities in these supply chains. And in addition, uh, this example also highlights some of the interdependencies in our critical infrastructure, such as between power networks and pharmaceutical supply chains. So here I'm using an extended definition of critical infrastructure going beyond roads, bridges, and so on to include the supply chains of critical goods and services as well. So in addition to understanding supply chains for particular products, it's also important for us to take a systems perspective so that we can understand the interdependencies between these different areas because they are not siloed. Um, during disaster response, when regular supply chains are no longer fully functional, relief supply chains get into motion so that we can deliver goods and services to those in need. Unfortunately, sometimes the prioritization of resources to support relief supply chains might have unintended consequences or even delay the recovery of regular supply chains. Um, for example, in the aftermath of Hurricane Irma, relief supplies such as tarps were prioritized over cement or other construction materials which may have delayed the reopening of the major hardware store in St. Thomas, and, and also may have delayed the repair and rebuilding efforts. So the focus of federal um, relief effort on public recipients may also contribute to delays. For example, the power grid was badly damaged in the US Virgin Islands. And yes, there were backup generators, but they were not sustainable for long-term use, um, either due to lack of generator fuel or proper maintenance. FEMA and Army Corps of Engineers provided generator assistance to critical public sector facilities, uh, such as airports and hospitals, but not to privately owned critical facilities, such as radio stations or cell phone powers, towers. So these examples highlight the importance of taking a systems perspective in making resource allocation and prioritization decisions. In particular, they show the importance of shifting our focus from pushing relief supplies to an area. Instead, we need to focus on supporting the restoration of regular supply chains so that the communities can return to some level of normalcy and self-sufficiency as quickly as possible. And this way of thinking might, might require some changes in the budgeting and distribution of federal funds for disaster preparedness and response. So now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Professor Julie Swan, uh, who is going to continue with some additional examples and insights. 
Thank you, Pinar. Many people experienced the winter storms in Texas and other parts of the United States this year. They were quite devastating. Uh, here you will see some pictures of, of some of the really uh, the things that illustrate some of the happenings during the winter storm. And really, if you look at what happened and why, there was this series of cascading events. It began with a storm with that was, uh, of course, cold for an area like Texas. Uh, the initial analysis of the storm and its impacts point to the fact that the electrical systems and power grid system was not winterized to a level that it could handle this storm. This had been identified as a challenge uh, in previous years, but it had not occurred because of the incentives in the system. So as frozen equipment uh, began happening with the temperatures, the electricity began turning off in some of the power plants and also in the homes, at the same time, the demand was really getting much, much higher for heat. Prices rose for natural gas, uh, which then led to an additional impact on the electricity, uh, some of which was, was powered by gas systems. Texas also has a separation from the national infrastructure for the power grid. So that contributed to the problems as well. So there were these cascading effects across these critical types of infrastructure in the system. It does highlight some of the same kinds of things that my colleague mentioned with critical infrastructure, the interdependencies and the importance for understanding those and thinking about those even in advance with analytical tools so that preparation mitigation and response could be better. Another critical step is to really look at that whole supply chain and making sure that it can respond to changes in demand, changes in supply, uh, and continuing to gather information on the functionality of the system and look at what happens in terms of those cascading effects. Another example comes from Hurricane Dorian, which hit the eastern part of the US, the Bahamas, and some other places. And in particular, this was a really strong uh, hurricane coming from the Atlantic side. Um, and one of the key factors with this hurricane is that there's an intersection with climate change and the changes that we're seeing in the environment. And with at least one expert uh, and, and one resident of the Bahamas specifying that you really couldn't have prepared for this because this was so much more than what it had been before. And that's partly because of the changes that we're seeing throughout the environment causing greater variability in temperatures, more extremes, more hots, more colds, causing greater variability in storms. And here too, there's a bit of a disconnect between the countries and the people who are contributing to the climate uh, and those who are suffering the consequences who are often ones who uh, may be vulnerable or have other kinds of reasons that they can be impacted. And of course, as we continue to see the rise in sea levels and increasing variability, we are going to continue to see events that we would have thought might have occurred once in a hundred years, but now we'll have multiple of these types of events over time. It's also useful to think, well, what is the role of government in these types of disasters such as hurricanes and other large storms? And really a lot of disaster response does begin at the local level. This is where the initial emergency response happens. There's coordination across public and private entities. The local organization may request assistance from the state if the disaster is big enough. The state emergency agencies also have their own responsibilities and they in turn may request additional assistance from the federal government if the disaster is a significant magnitude. And in some cases, disasters affect more than one state simultaneously. Federal governments, uh, including a, a number of agencies, uh, does uh, approve or deny federal assistance, but also has other roles to play in terms of damage assessment and activating a federal response plan.
There is a number of different areas where analytical techniques and data can really contribute to the ability to reduce the impacts of uh, hurricanes and other disasters. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes on in hazard mapping, so determining what locations are at great risk for impacts from hurricanes, floods, or even earthquakes. There is a lot of this that's built into land use and zoning as well. We certainly wouldn't want to build a really tall skyscraper right on top of an earthquake fault, for example. Uh, similarly, we can look at the floodplain in an area and be careful what the zoning is for that section of uh, a geography. Building codes, there's a strong relationship there. Uh, determining what homes are in flood prone areas and then potentially raising them off the ground as was done in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. There's also work that can be done to pre-identify communities that are vulnerable or individual people who are vulnerable, such as the elderly, who, who some of whom have reduced mobility and may find it difficult to evacuate. And plans can be put in place across these different vulnerable organiz organizations, communities, and individuals. There's really a lot of work that also happens that's really driven by people. It's driven by partnerships that government agencies have with companies and nonprofits. And these are really important to disaster response. Home Depot is well known for having a, a detailed disaster response plan. So are organizations like Waffle House restaurants. Uh, FEMA once referred to the Waffle House Index of Disasters. If Waffle House can get there, that tells you, you know, what, what level of disaster it is. Uh, so those partnerships are really uh, very important across the entire spectrum. Preparedness is also the key. We know that the more dollars and in investment that are put into preparedness, then the less will be needed for response and recovery. And this is true for infrastructure, it's true for communities, it's true for individual households. And at that community level as well, there's a lot of work that can be done both in advance of a disaster and then during a disaster where volunteers are available and can be matched up with the appropriate needs of that particular location at that point in time. Um, there are lots of other uh, important areas related to hurricanes and disasters, but with that, we're going to conclude the, the formal presentation, and I believe that we're turning to Jeff Cohen to address whether there are any questions. Julie Pinar, thank you both. That was very interesting, very informative. Uh, Pinar, let me start with you. Um, as you were talking about systems level thinking, um, and assessment and preparedness and response. How do you think um, the prioritization ought to be, the balance between resources um, uh, and the deployment of, of not just dollars, but of time in terms of you know, response versus preparedness? A any thoughts that you would like to share on that? Well, there's a saying, right? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And this certainly applies to disaster preparedness and response as well. Uh, so it's very important to make resources and funding available for preparedness to the extent possible. Um, data science, modeling, uh, analytics, all of these can help us tremendously uh, to evaluate alternatives uh, and suggest the best use of limited resources so that we can increase the resiliency and reduce the negative impact of such disasters on communities. Um, and during the response phase, as we also mentioned during the presentation, it's really important to support the recovery efforts, um, engaging with and supporting both the public sector and the private sector. Uh, so the goal is not just to deliver aid during response, but rather to engage in a broader set of support efforts so that we can quickly return to normalcy. And again, data science and analytics has a critical role to play during the response phase as well. Uh, we could go on with a very long list of examples here, but consider decisions such as um, if and when to evacuate, uh, there are a lot of trade-offs, how to prioritize different geographic areas for post-disaster debris clearance, 
which impacts both how quickly we can deliver aid and how, how quickly we can get people out of uh, potential dangerous areas. So all of these decisions require um, significant um, trade-offs, the consideration of significant trade-offs in, um, in resource allocation and uh, benefits significantly from uh, data science and analytics. Great. Well, let's take that a little bit further, Julie, in your presentation, you talked about uh, the roles of uh, the local, the state and the federal government. I'm wondering from your work, your experience, do you have any insights into how uh, you know, various levels of government are using data science? Are there opportunities for them to do more of it or to do it better or differently in order to uh, sort of achieve that balance that Pinar was discussing? Great question. And uh, let me focus a little bit on the federal level because that's where there's a lot of momentum right now. Um, there are many different federal agencies that are involved in disaster response. You've got FEMA, of course, on the emergency management side. Uh, you potentially have Health and Human Services along with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, you could have Department of Homeland Security, depending on what kind of disaster. The National Guard is often called out. So there are lots of different agencies, uh, and, and there are more, of course, especially when you start talking about the, the preparedness size. We've got Department of Transportation and all the work and infrastructure and, and so many more. All of the federal agencies have been asked to have a data science officer and to really develop plans to move the US forward in our data plans. And the federal government has a really important role in that because this needs to be done across all of the states and all communities. There are many different challenges in the disaster space with respect to data. You can imagine that you want to be able to get data real time and to for the data to be actionable and usable by decision makers. You're often aggregating data coming from different kinds of data streams, different kinds of places, so you need to be doing that. You've got to make the data uh, secure if it needs to be secure, but also available to the public or others who might need to be making decisions. So these data science officers are really looking into all of these different kinds of things. I think that the US has made some inroads over the last few years in terms of data science, but we still have a long ways to go. There are a lot of opportunities in this space to bring together these different kinds of data streams, not all of which are owned by the federal government. We've certainly seen the rise of data from social media and Google and SafeGraph and other kinds of entities. And that kind of data that might show us where the population population is at a given point in time can be really useful. Uh, there's also a lot of analytics that needs to happen on the modeling side. Uh, and so that's another space where there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but really also a lot of opportunities as well. Oh, that's great. You know, I think most of us tend to think of, of disasters um, as in, in terms of the discrete event right, a hurricane is coming and we focus on, on the TV and the building of the storm and the evacuation. And then of course the storm hits and you know, people are interested in the imagery and what's happening on, on the response level. And these things happen you know, one after another in varying amounts year after year. But I'm wondering, back to Pinar's point about systems level thinking, should the policy community reframe the way it's thinking about preparedness to that systems level uh, event. If you map the types of disasters and the numbers of disasters so year after year, would it portend a way that we uh, fund you know, these activities differently, that we plan for these activities differently, that we preposition resources differently? Any thoughts on that from a data science or 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 analytics perspective? And really, I would, I guess, open that up for, for either you, uh, Julie, or Pinar. Uh, so that's an interesting uh, point. And, you know, it's not just the number of disasters, but it's also the impact, uh, which is an impact on people, uh, as well as property, and even potentially other kinds of, of impact. You can imagine that, you know, people is first measured by lives lost, or maybe something like hospitalizations, but then it, it could also be measured by absenteeism from schools, for example, um, because of flooding in an area. 
you know, we do know that there are more disasters where there are cascading effects and simultaneous kinds of things coming. We saw that in, in Texas where the cascade from the ice to the power and the water and that had huge uh, impacts uh, across the whole state. We've seen in a, a, across the country, we have lots of different kinds of disasters, each with their own kind of impact from wildfires in California, tornadoes in Kansas, uh, you know, hurricanes that, that really are all along the coast. Um, but we are going to see a greater impact on uh, cascading events and simultaneous kinds of things. And we do have to think about measuring those beyond just the number of events, but really based on the impact. You know, Pinar, Julie mentioned uh, a little bit the, the private sector um, and I think noted Home Depot and, and Waffle House. But I know from, from your work as well, you spend time uh, working with you know, private sector organizations. What ought to be their role, uh, either sort of uniquely in this question or again from a system level thinking, as a way to you know, augment what the uh, federal, state, or local government is doing um, as they think about their own supply chains and how they're going to help you know, the communities that they serve? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the private sector has been using data science and analytics for a long time uh, in their day to day operations, but also in preparing and responding uh, to disasters. Um, so I'll, I'll give again Home Depot as an example, which uses sophisticated forecasting and planning uh, tools in advance, uh, considering the fact that residents need different types of products while they are preparing for an approaching storm, and then other types of products after the storm hits uh, for cleaning and rebuilding. So this deployment of the right products to the right place at the right time uh, benefits significantly from data science and analytics, and broadly speaking, supply chain management, modeling, and decision support. And Julie mentioned partnerships. So this is an area where, again, I would like to highlight the importance of public-private partnerships, and particularly the government organizations uh, working closely with the private sector and in their response effort, not only supporting the public sector, but also the private sector so that we can quickly bring back the, the, the community into some level of normalcy. Uh, so I, I, this has been a very interesting you know, discussion. And I'm wondering, uh, as we wrap up, do you have any insights into how uh, you know, Congress and federal agencies might collaborate better from a data science perspective so that each can do their jobs better in performing their mission on behalf of, of the public? So there are two areas that I'd like to highlight. I think um, what often happens in disasters is that a disaster hits and there is a desire to improve the conditions. And so there is a response. And that is important and that's absolutely needed. But where you really get the benefit is when you invest ahead of time before a disaster hits to improve things you improve the infrastructure, you improve the housing, you nudge individuals and households and communities towards preparing at a local level. And this takes funding, it, it does. And sometimes you prepare for a disaster that doesn't show up that year. And so you have to be willing to accept that. But if you look over the longer term, where, where you really invest both your resources and your time and your energy in preparedness and addressing problems before they happen, then the impact of an event can be much smaller on a community, on a nation. And so I think that's a really important area for Congress and federal agencies to continue to work together on. The second area that I'd like to highlight relates a little bit to data science, and but also thinking about how we move forward. I think the easier thing to do is to say, this is the kind of data that we're collecting right now. Let's do it better. Let's do it more efficiently, more effectively. Let's add in and make sure we've covered equity when we're tracking what's happening in populations. And all of that is really important. But I think what we also need to be doing is saying, what are we not doing right now? And how can we achieve that? 
So one of the things that we've seen over the past year is the rise of different kinds of data sets in different locations. And many of these are not controlled by the government, but they are really useful for understanding what's happening on the ground and then you know, using that in the decision-making on responding. And so that's an area where really some of that has just become more apparent in the last couple of years. So Congress and the federal agencies really need to think, what are we not doing right now? And how can we innovate and perhaps work with private partnership, perhaps get ideas from the outside, but change is always hard and it's particularly hard for larger organizations. So finding ways to continue to bring in innovation and change. And I would like to add one more thing to what Julie said. This this was excellent summary, Julie. Uh, just particularly on the preparedness side, I think it's important for all of us to invest into preparedness during normal times. Uh, particularly considering the fact that whether it's uh, private sector representatives or government rec representative, there is change over time. So the memory sometimes is not there. Uh, we may have experienced an event and people who were there at that time will have that memory and that will play a good role in the preparedness over the next couple of years. Maybe we invest into generators or other things. And then nothing happens for a while. We get lucky and people change. Now we lost that memory and we decide, oh, why are we investing into these generators and tying up our money? Uh, we don't need it, let's get rid of them. And lo and behold, next year you might have something. So, so it's very important for us to be continuously on the lookout for how we can improve our preparedness by engaging different stakeholders, thinking about what kinds of decisions are we going to make in case of a disaster? What information do we need for making these decisions uh, in the right way? And how do we allocate our resources who is responsible, who are the stakeholders, and making sure that these happen, these people come together, work on hands-on exercises, scenarios during normal times, so that we can continuously improve our preparedness and then make the right decisions uh, in the aftermath of a disaster. Great. Julie Pinar, thank you very much. This was a really terrific you know, conversation. Uh, for those of you watching uh, today's presentation, INFORMS is here to be a resource uh, for you. Earlier in the presentation on the screen, we had contact information for both Julie and Pinar. Feel free to use it. M my contact information is here as well, and I'm happy to you know, put you in touch with uh, both Julie and Pinar. And if you're working on other policy matters and interested in how OR and analytics uh, can help you from a policy perspective, feel free to reach out to INFORMS and we'd love to uh, work with you on that. Thank you.